All right, and Claire Carter joins me now from Regina. Claire, how are you today? I'm doing very well, thank you. How are you? I am great uh, as we dig out here uh, in the nation's capital, uh, but uh, that's all good. Everyone, uh, as far as I know, is doing well with the weather. And as we were talking about before we started, I spent a couple of years in Regina, so and you lived in Ottawa, so we have a we we know the weather in each of our locations here, <laughs> which in right. January always yeah. gives you a lot to talk about. A weather kinship, right? <laughs> Absolutely. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> So uh, so let's get into the book. As I said in the intro, it's Who's Coming Out to Play? Disruption and Disorientation in Queer Community Sports. And I wanted to start with a bit of the scope of the research because you, you hear that title and there are a lot of uh, queer leagues uh, and gay athletes participating in sports, uh, both professionally and amateur. So what is the scope of this research? How many leagues are you looking at? What's the regional reputation? representation like and level of competition as you said you know we have pro leagues we have amateur leagues we have just pure recreational leagues so so how did you try to wade through all of the different levels of sport to try to figure out the scope of what you're going to do here absolutely so the just to start off the the book is informed by two kind of projects and one which sort of started um, that wasn't as focused specifically on leagues, but more on people that were participating in them. And so their experiences doing sports um, and identifying as queer or trans. And then the second project specifically dove into participation in leagues. And so the first one, I tried to kind of get a, a cro cross section in some ways. So I had connections with queer community in both um, Vancouver and Toronto. And because I was living in Regina, those were the three cities that I looked at. But you may not be surprised to hear that there aren't any actual leagues uh, in Regina that, you know, queer community sports leagues predominantly exist in major urban centers, though there are hints here and there of them, um, you know, kind of popping up um, in, I mean, in Saskatchewan. So I, I did hear rumors of that, but that hasn't happened yet. So the second project really focused on Toronto and Vancouver and sort of five or six leagues in each place. Some people sort of more representative. So, for example, both uh, cities, the softball leagues had huge representation, um, but also the women's hockey collective in Toronto um, and pink turf soccer was well represented in both cities. But Vancouver also has this really fantastic new league called Double Rainbow Dodgeball. So there was representation from that as well. Um, there's a volleyball league in Vancouver. So but it didn't didn't have too many participants from that. So the predominant leagues were soccer, basketball, softball, um, but they're all community leagues. So they're all recreational, although t the softball leagues do have um, levels. So some people play completely recreationally and just kind of to socialize. Then there's kind of an intermediate level and some also have a competitive level. But that was really the focus for me was on kind of recreational leagues um, and and basically because I was interested in them, in them as kind of community spaces so that you're actually going to kind of forge community or find community as opposed to, um, you know, going to kind of participate in elite sport. But some of the players were also engaged in elite leagues. So you did have some crossover between maybe high performance athletes. This is something that we see in curling somewhat frequently where you'll have high performance athletes who participate in the community leagues and the gay nationals. We've had players who have played in Briar Scotties before. So there is that crossover in the other sports that, that these athletes are coming yes. and playing in the more recreational, non-competitive settings. Yes, not not to a large extent, but there were definitely some players that play on other leagues that are far more competitive, but they, you know, they have different pulls for the different leagues, right? Like that's where I go if I want to, you know, have competitive soccer, but here's where I really come to be with my community. Yeah. What and about, can, is there any... They spoke about it. Sorry, go ahead. No, sorry, go ahead. No, 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 please, please. I was going to say, you know, they spoke about, a lot of players would speak about that, that kind of um, different investment, right? Like that's where I go and get skill development and kind of learn about the sport, um, but also kind of push back on some of the things um, that go on there, kind of around gender politics. But community leagues, there was a really deep personal investment. I think, um, you know, there were some comments even about you have a responsibility or a duty to play. Like this is your community and you need to support it. So that real deep investment um, was spoken of quite highly by players in the community leagues. It was different um, from the way that they would speak about the other leagues they, they played on. What about cross sport? Because in these major centers, you do have, say, a lot of Olympic athletes who might participate in one sport. Do you see that representation across sport that maybe you see an elite athlete come play in a, the softball league for fun to be part of that community? Are you seeing that crossover at all? 
I, that didn't come up too much at all. Uh, I shouldn't say at all in the conversation. So I didn't have someone to say, you know, I, I perform at that kind of really elite level and yet come to play. It was more people that had been playing that sport for, you know, since they were kids, had gone through, you know, varsity teams um, and kind of still played in kind of competitive league um, city leagues, but that also then wanted to participate yeah, in more recreational community leagues. Now, the, the book also focuses on uh, women slash lesbian leagues and their transition into more gender queer inclusive uh, leagues. So what is leading that change and why are we seeing it go from a specific lesbian leagues into this more gender queer inclusive setting? So what drew, what drew me to those leagues, I'll just kind of take a, a back step briefly, but um, when I was doing my kind of doctoral research at York, I was interested in kind of women's everyday body practices. And um, I, I use women as how women, people identified as women. And one of the participants spoke about um, going to a queer positive boxing gym and participating and um, the coach kind of commenting like, oh, you're moving really well. You move like you're a hundred pounds. And it's sort of reflecting to me that, you know, as a fat identified dyke, I don't feel comfortable or safe in a lot of these community spaces that are actually supposed to be queer positive. And so it got me interested thinking about um, community spaces and what was happening in terms of their inclusivity, who felt welcome, and kind of knowing um, that the community uh, and society more broadly was, was gaining an awareness around trans inclusivity and trans rights. And so a lot of leagues, I mean, just blatantly kind of said, you know, the community is changing and we need to reflect our community. And so we need to do this work. Um, so for example, that came out of the hockey league in Toronto, that even though their title still says women's hockey club, you know, they've changed their language and they've made it really open that they're welcoming of all players. Um, and even one of the commentators for um, the soccer team in um, Vancouver sort of said, you know, there was a gap, there was a lack of services and programming and even community spaces for trans people. So, you know, we actually oriented this league to be trans inclusive from the start so that there would be recreational spaces available. So there was sort of that awareness, right? The community is changing and as, you know, community kind of services, we need to change with it. We need to provide those spaces. And I think just a genuine desire. Um, some of those community members had formerly identified as lesbians, so had long-standing relationships with the community, and wanted to be, you know, continue to support their community members. So, this sort of a, co a complex range of reasons, but really it was kind of that that community recognition that you know we're not um, currently uh, in a space where we're being publicly inclusive, and we need to do that. We need to do that work. Does that lead to any potential points of tension with potentially the old guard, people who've been in a league for a long time, really identify themselves as lesbians and as a, as a potentially lesbian league? Did, did you see any tension within this transition? So there were some leagues, um, you know, that talked about not making that transition, that they wanted to remain staying as lesbian spaces. It wasn't a league I spoke to, but it was a participant early on that just said, you know, I'm part of a league that actually made the decision not to do that. Um, and there, the tension more was around uh, players actually admitting kind of an ignorance in terms of, you know, I grew up in a small town. I'm not really you know, aware of some of the issues around um, how to better support trans players. So that was definitely a set of tension. And so, you know, feeling uncomfortable asking, like, how do I actually approach someone? And, you know, I don't want to offend anybody, but I, I'm ignorant. I don't know. So this, that was the kind of space that was talked about. Um, and then the other issue is, which is pretty common, specific, you know, especially given uh, the broader, um, you know, Olympic narratives that are going on, were some kind of black and white assumptions around bodies and testosterone and um, transition. And uh, there was one kind of section I talk about in the book, but there's kind of this whole range, right? Some people saying, you know what? I think that, um, you know, trans people should just have a separate league. That's really the only way to address this. Other people kind of saying everybody is welcome. And really our focus is on playing, not winning. It's on just actually having fun. So we should just welcome everybody. And then other people kind of saying, you know, for me, it's actually about socialization. So, you know, a lot of players had been on mixed gender leagues on sort of, um, co-ed leagues and had found that a lot of male players, you know, were really aggressive and assertive and didn't share the ball or, you know, didn't share time or that they had rules. You had to have two women on. And so they said, really, if you're open to playing with everybody and you're respectful and you're fair, like, great, like really we're here to just have fun. So the tension was, you know, around that spectrum. Um, but there were, you know, again, it's a minority of people, but I think that had very specific ideas 
likely informed by the media, but about yeah bodies and testosterone and what was considered fair or unfair. And what about the idea too, and this just occurred to me, because you see it sometimes in mixed leagues, and again, I'll use the curling example, where couples play together in mixed leagues, or even there's defined singles leagues where uh, singles go uh, in a in a heterosexual or heteronormative sense. You go, you play with men, women together as a way to meet people. Is there that element, a romantic element potential, where this could be a a place where you could meet a partner? Absolutely, um, yeah. I mean, people spoke of that. Um, quite significantly that really it's a social space. And for people, you know, if I'm moving to a new city and I don't necessarily want to go out into the bar scene, this is the space to come meet people. And I think one of your questions had been about stereotypes. And I think, you know, this is one that, you know, we'll go to sports. That's where the gay, you know, that's where the gay and queer and trans people are going to be, that th this will be a space outside of the bar space. And I think also just because it is, um, it's a space where you see people regularly over, you know, a season. So there's time to build those relationships, but yes, absolutely. Um, and I think not just for romantic interest, but for um, friendships. Right. So, yeah, we mentioned or you mentioned the, the stereotypes and there, there is a specific stereotype of women in sports. Uh, and again, I think that's specifically high performance athletes. There, there is that yeah. that stereotype. I think some of it at least is born out of the Cold War image of, say, Soviet women that that participated in, in the Olympics during those years. But how do the participants, how do these leagues themselves think of those stereotypes or do they think of them at all? And do the leagues themselves influence the way in which the participants themselves and potentially other people in the community view those stereotypes of women in sports? So the leagues themselves didn't seem too preoccupied with them. I think they just kind of, you know, yeah, you know, people in, in some ways, straight culture can have those stereotypes, let them have them like we're just here to have fun. But what was in some ways actually surprising to me that came up quite early was how players navigated them. Um, so players that played on both queer leagues and on a kind of mixed leagues or co-ed leagues. Uh, or leagues with straight women would sort of reference what is quite well known within the queer sports sociology literature. Um, you know, the presence of that big, uh, I think one of the references, you know, big butch hulking around, like this idea of kind of, you know, uh, a, you know, a fat woman um, who looks tough, who looks mean, and probably looks kind of a drone, like this really, you know, stereotype that has emerged through the media. Uh, and the way that that they kind of internalized that and kind of countered it, you know, I don't want to be perceived as that. Um, and so a few people kind of spoke to that. And also a sense of um, internalized homophobia that would come up in some ways. So, you know, not wanting to be the only lesbian in the change room when they would play on leagues with other people uh, and the way that that uh, affected how they kind of moved through sporting spaces. And similarly for players that um, identified masculine of center or, you know, wanted to participate in sports that were also mixed, the way that that stereotype came into play. But predominantly, it, it wasn't something that was spoken about at all by the leagues. Um, but it was rather individual players talked about trying to navigate, um, yeah, navigate against that. And one of the, um, so two of the other kind of studies that I referenced a lot, both spoke about that, that players kind of reference this idea of being, you know, this big butch hulking around um, or this assumption that queer women are fat and, and having to then kind of um, think about their participation in the sport as a way to distance themselves from that stereotype. So even changing language, like Genevieve Rail, um, um, piece talks about, you know, not using lesbian, right, or not using um, dyke and some of that terminology to kind of distance from the perceived stereotype. What about during the game, too? Like, as you play, did, did women who you talk to as part of this think of that or change the way they actually played the game if they were playing with straight women or with men compared to in these leagues? Like, is that part of their thinking, too, even subconsciously, of that they have to be, yeah. be either more or less aggressive in one setting during the game? Yeah, that's really interesting. No one spoke about that. Um I mean, what, what tended to come up in talking about being on co-ed leagues, not so much on being on leagues with other women, was um, 
yeah, about actually trying to kind of shift the, the rules of play, so to speak. So challenging this idea, we can only have two women on or actually being uh, more participatory and equal in terms of sharing time on the field or on the court or, or the, you know, uh, and supporting players. And so it's kind of to disrupt um, what they perceived as, you know, a bit of misogyny in play. Um, but the one thing that did come out when uh, queer women would talk about playing on straight leagues was just how um, they would, you know, they would kind of adapt how they would be at post games. So if they would all go out for drinks afterwards, there would be kind of more attention about what they were going to say, how they were going to maybe talk about their partners um, and, and how they would dress. Right. This is the idea, sort of an expectation of dressing up to go out, whereas if they were going up with, you know, their colleagues from the queer leagues, it would just be like, let's just put on our sweats and, and go right after the game. So kind of different pressured expectations and wanting to feel comfortable that tended to, to come up more. But no one actually spoke about, um, yeah, adapting how they play uh, on different leagues. Um, but that's really interesting. Yeah. Well, for me, it's it's a case of like I've played in, it's called an open league in Monday night open league here in, in Ottawa at the Ottawa right. curling club. And one of my teammates, Megan, she's the convener of the league. Regularly she will comment uh, during a game. She'll say, Hey, I'm the only woman out here in what is supposed to be mm -hmm. an open league. So it, it makes me wonder about, mm -hmm. you know, how, how actually welcoming are, is this league to women? Are, are women feeling like yeah. they're not, actually welcomed or whatever yeah. the scenario is but it, it struck me as i as you were speaking that that could be something that does limit women's participation in in this particular yes. league and it's it's sort of an example yeah. of what you're talking about yeah because several several players did talk about that experience of of growing up and playing on leagues and continuing to try to play on leagues that were you know mixed uh you know both with straight and and you know kind of all gender players and speaking about, you know, that they just don't get the same experience. They don't get to play as much. They don't feel as respected. Um, and, you know, one of the kind of uh, phrasings I use is sort of feminine visibility, right? This assumption that you won't be as good. Uh, that also came up a little bit within queer community spaces, but that you won't be as good uh, a player if you're more femme identified. Um, and so that was definitely, yeah, that was definitely something people spoke about and, and a reason to want to find queer community sports where that wouldn't be, that wouldn't be the case. Now you mentioned the rules of play and uh, the, the occasional misogyny, if not regular misogyny that comes up in, in mixed leagues, certainly. And I've played softball, uh, mixed softball, and uh, the women on our team have pointed it out to us uh, regularly uh, when it's happened that, Hey, you're making us play this position all the time, or we're always hitting la or whatever it is. And, you know, and, and it's something that I wasn't conscious of until it was pointed out to me. So how do these leagues try to combat those types of things of, of women being pretty much pigeonholed uh, in, sometimes in these mixed leagues? The, the example for me in softball is the catch. We play like three pitch and it's usually a woman who is asked to be the catcher uh, as a position that doesn't really do much. And and the women on our team are like, well, that's dumb. I want to do something like I'm here to play. Right. So, you know, so, so that, right. So that sort of thing. So what, so is that the sort of thing that you're talking about in terms of the rules of play, a kind of breaking away from those misogynistic type of roles that women are often placed in, in these mixed leagues? Absolutely. I mean, even just from their very intro, what was so interesting to me is looking at all of their websites and the language that's used. Like the focus is, um, you know, whether we want to talk about them being feminist or sort of social justice or community oriented, but really the focus on how can we make this space open and welcoming to everybody. And we want all levels uh, and we really want to foster a space where, you know, you can come and feel uh, welcome and able to participate. And so kind of that the, the emphasis is on providing, you know, a welcoming space, you know, versus, you know, we're here to kind of be the best team that we can possibly be. Let me be clear that they're very competitive often as well, but it's it's kind of the outset, right? That focus is a little bit different. And so that really opens up uh, a space for, for people to then kind of continue to reevaluate. Like, why do we do the things we do? You know, and someone kind of spoke about, like, for a long time, I'd been wanting to play sports, but because I live with chronic illness, I just didn't know if I could handle it. But the softball league that they play in, in Toronto has a policy that you can go up to bat and someone else can run for you. Right. So it's a way of like still feeling able to participate and actually be an athlete and be in sports, um, 
but again, to be able to be flexible with, you know, their bodily demands at the time. Um, and similarly, you know, being really reflective of language that is used in play, because for a lot of people that can have a pretty detrimental impact. And they offer um, different leagues offered skill workshops. So if you want to come in and say, you know, someone for me who's never played soccer uh, and I'm like, yeah, I'd like to play goalie. Well, then they'll support you in learning kind of the skills to do to be a goalie. And there isn't kind of this harsh um, like, oh, you wouldn't be good at that. So you can't try that. Like there's a you know much more kind of open welcomeness and I think a gratitude probably for people wanting to play goal. But um, so that's a real shift as well. Like I think there's an openness to people trying different positions. Um, and respecting that some people really love a certain position. And, and again, all within a context that some teams get really competitive and want to build like a really great team. Um, but they do their best to actually not have what are called quote unquote stacked teams. So they try, they get people to fill out, you know, when they sign up, you know, what is your level and try to mix teams so that they have some people that are new and some people that are experienced. So again, there can kind of be that mentorship and skill building that goes on and also to prevent, you know, one or two teams dominating, um, dominating the league in terms of, yeah, right. winning. Because it's no fun when you are playing against a team that are just so good, you can't even kind of get a chance to do anything. So yeah, yeah. all and of those, um, yeah. Well, and it's no fun to be that team sometimes either. Like a, a 30 to nothing game in say softball, yeah. like that's no fun for anybody, right? Even the team, no. uh, even the team winning. Absolutely. And it, 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 it's reflective too. I think oftentimes with recreational sports, it's come play. And there's no thought to practice or skill development, which could be something that prohibits new people from joining a league because they don't have an opportunity to learn whether the rules or the technique or whatever it is. So those sorts of things are actually very important and should be more like, I mean, in curling, we do it a little bit with learn to curl leagues and the success of them and the quality of them really depend on, on who's running it. But at least it's an acknowledgement that, Hey, we need to get people in here and teach yeah. them how to play. Absolutely. And what I think it really fosters, which to me was, you know, one of the you know really beautiful parts of doing this work and working with these leagues is it then opens up further kind of, you know, conversations about, well, what are our assumptions about, about different bodies, right? Do I assume only certain bodies are going to be fast? Do I assume certain bodies are going to have, you know, more upper body strength because of how I'm interpreting them and reading them? You know, and quite a few players talked about why they were, um, so grateful, but also so open to, you know, gender, queer and trans inclusivities, because it really prompted a lot of this like critical self-reflection for cis players to sort of say, what are my assumptions around gender and bodies? What are my assumptions around bodily ability? And, you know, even just the reflection you just had, what are some of the ways, you know, there were a few leaks that said, you know, what are some of the ways that we maybe aren't welcoming to queers of color or trans people of color that, you know, we just haven't thought about because we've just been kind of continually, you know, a lot of them, they don't need to advertise because word of mouth, they're full all the time. Um, but really starting to recognize there are a lot of people that are missing from these leagues that we want to have, you know, be included. What are ways that we can do that work? So kind of setting off, um, you know, with that kind of, you know, principle of when we want to foster a welcoming inclusive space then leads to other questions about you know is pronoun rounds a way to kind of make people feel comfortable and do we do that at the beginning do we do it each game because there's going to be subs and um and kind of educating on why pronoun rounds are important you know so those kinds of conversations um were possible because of the way that they frame their leagues yeah. and and i think part of that too will be generational i mean i, I work with high school students and we had the the group of us, the, the the adults, before we met with them, we talked a lot about pronouns and what we should do with pronouns and uh, based on one of our participants. And we it was like about an hour long conversation because none of us had, had dealt with that before. And then in the moment when the kids came in, we did pronouns and they were like, yeah, of course, like, what do you like? Of course we do. Like, like, right. So like, it, it's, it, you know, like yes. the kids didn't care. Like they, they had dealt with it. They understood it way better than we yeah. did. So I, yeah. it, you know, as things have changed over the last 10, 20 years, it, it, it'll continue to change as younger generations start to be the leaders in these, in these spaces. Absolutely. And there, you know, there were those moments of, um, of, of tension. And I think, you know, of transphobia where some people just, you know, hadn't grown up with it and didn't understand. And so even the league would have language that would say, you know, we're trans inclusive. And, you know, uh, you know, one of the comments from uh, a league organizer was like, you know, someone got really mad when I, you know, called them ladies. I was like, what's the big deal? 
you know, another kind of one of their colleagues said, well, you know, we promote this as being trans inclusive. Like that's our responsibility to do that work. But, you know, it's kind of that, as you say, it's partly generational and partly just having not done the work to kind of recognize yeah. right, what the impact is. And, and I think a lot of, um, you know, speaking as a cis person, I think a lot of cis people, you know, haven't done that work to sort of sit down and take that time to think about what misgendering, what the, you know, the violent impact of that can be for players um, because they don't have that lived experience and haven't kind of extended themselves to that. Um, so that was definitely something that a few players came out and a lot of them, you know, were quite uh, open about, you know, I don't have that knowledge and experience, but I'm, but I'm supportive and I want to learn, you know, and, um, and so trying to navigate that, but yeah, but you're right. I think there is, it's nice to see that, that huge generational shift that I think is happening, yeah. that it's, it's quite a normalized practice with young people. Yeah. And I'm not even that old. And I'm in my mid thirties and these kids <laughs> are just totally outpacing yeah. me. It's uh, remarkable. Yeah. But in terms of the, the question of language, again, this has come up in curling a little bit when we're trying to create more inclusive spaces. One of the, the things that has come up is let's just stop using the word club and say curling facility, right? It's as opposed to a club, which sounds exclusive, that you have to be a member right. to get in, right? Like th that's a little thing. Uh, so in these leagues, when they're talking about language, mm -hmm. is it, obviously gendered language would be a huge part of it, but does it go beyond to the way they frame the league or even rules or just the, the sport? Like, like how deep does the discussion about language go? I mean, I think it varies across some leagues. Um, and I think, again, some that are larger have more people kind of involved in helping to kind of run the leagues versus some that it's like one person just trying to like book the games every week. So there's definitely, <laughs> you know, you know, a range of, of people depending on their time. But yeah, I think it's, you know, the, the language in terms of gender language is a huge part. Um, but also I think some of the language in terms of how they divide, like what do we mean by recreational? What do we mean by intermediate? Um, and, and thinking through what is what are assumptions about play in those contexts as well. Um, and I think, you know, a lot of... Um, a lot of it is really, you know, moving towards an accessibility lens, right? So how are we, you know, again, trying to be more inclusive? So what was really great about a conversation with the dodgeball uh, league in Vancouver is, you know, they had a, a team that wanted to play, a deaf team that wanted to play. And it was like, okay, how do we score, keep and cheer in ways that are more accessible? And it was, you know, in some ways a response to an inquiry, but it's again, because they're part of this collective of leagues in Vancouver, it's got other leagues to start saying, okay, what are ways that we play that might be inaccessible? Um, so I think that's starting to, to filter down for sure. Yeah, like I, I would say, again, in my curling experience, I've had experience, I've, I've played against a wheelchair team in an event before. Uh, I've played against uh, a deaf team before, the deaf nationals. Uh, are held every year in Ottawa, which is a great event to go see. Uh, there's also the Vision Impaired, or actually, excuse me, the Vision Impaired event is is held every year in Ottawa. Um, we do have hearing impaired folks uh, who play in our leagues. And so it, it, it is interesting to think of, of how you as the opponent even have to potentially adapt. Yes. Oftentimes you, you don't necessarily have to change anything about how you play, uh, but it, it is kind of interesting to see the space itself changing so that more and more people yes. can participate, which goes beyond just being inclusive and it being the right thing to do. There's also a financial imperative to it, like to get down to like the brass tax of it, right? Like for the for a lot of these sports to survive and to thrive, they have to do this. So not only is it the right thing to do, it's also the smart thing to do for the sport. And does that come up at all in the research, like the the actual survival of leagues, the financial reality of doing this? No, I would almost say the opposite, like the leagues, uh, you know, I, I talked to quite a few of them. So, for example, um, you know, Queer Van Hoops, the basketball league in Vancouver, um, you know, they just they have quite a small league, small number of teams. And, you know, they've had conversations year after year, like, should we grow? Uh, but there was an awareness that a lot of players on that league play on other leagues. And so, you know, they almost are doing something once a week. And if they broke it up and actually had, you know, two or three nights a week, then people wouldn't actually get to meet and, you know, form a bit of a community you just kind of come play your game and leave um but they are all you know all of the leagues had wait lists they really don't do any promotion it's primarily through word of mouth um and they're not able to kind of meet the current demand so that was something that was definitely spoken to but alongside that is this desire to again yeah reflect the community 
better. So I'm trying to strategize on how to how to do that. And what is it about sport that makes it so popular for these leagues that there are wait lists? You, you see it across the country. Uh, again, if, if I could use the curling example, uh, the Nationals, I think now is up to nine cities that that submit teams and, and the, the national championship rotates between those cities that have uh, that have uh, leagues. So why sports like the I mean, I'm sure there are book clubs. I'm sure there are other like meetup clubs running, I guess running is a sport too, but like other sorts of social (laughs) clubs that could meet the same end towards inclusivity and building community. So what is it about sport that make these so powerful? I mean, I think it's two things. I think, uh, I mean, probably it's multiple things, but I mean, you know, a lot of people sort of spoke about, you know, moving to a new city uh, and the struggle as adults, right, which has been, you know, talked about a lot to actually meet friends. Um, so to, to meet people outside of your kind of work or family environment. Um, and particularly if you are new to coming out to have a space that is supportive, uh, which we tend not to think about so much anymore. But I mean, participants that I spoke to, um, you know, in Toronto would be driving almost two hours once a week to come and play because it just this space wasn't, you know, available in their local community. Um, so because, you know, I've often lived in major urban centers, you kind of forget about the vitality and the importance of these spaces. So really um, a space to come and meet friends and have community. And I think, again, you know, the, the sort of tension, um, everyone wanting to do something, right, uh, to be a part of something, some kind of, you know, community group. So whether it is a book club, but, but sports really fills that. Um, and there's so many avenues and opportunities when you're younger to kind of try out things and do activities, but it's much harder to do again when you're older. Um, so I think providing a space that is, you know, welcoming and, you know, you can be completely unskilled at it, but come and try it out. I think a lot of us as adults feel that kind of anxiety or nervousness to try something new that we feel like we have to be good at it already. Um, so I think these spaces kind of provide that, provide that opportunity. Um, and I think it, you know, again, it speaks to kind of the necessity um, of providing community spaces for the you know, trans community and for the queer community that are outside of, you know, what is kind of thought of as that, you know, the, gay village, for example, um, that provide alternative spaces for people to meet and get together that don't kind of focus primarily on those, on those spaces or those, um, yeah, on drinking or on, you know, kind of partying as it were, like provide alternative spaces. And of course there are others, but yeah, I think sports provides that kind of dual opportunity. Right. And do you think that representation at the highest level has influenced or impacted the way participants think of their own sporting careers uh, at their, their participation in these leagues. We saw at the Olympics back in the summer. Uh, and I, I apologize. I forget the name of the, the player on the uh, Canadian soccer team uh, who won the gold medal. There was the New Zealand weightlifter who qualified as well. So, so is that type of representation influencing the way potentially these players uh, think of their own participation in the sport or even the number of people who might come to some of these leagues? I think it definitely has an influence. And I mean, you know, one of the things I was just realized I didn't kind of share, but I think another reason that, that, you know, these leagues are so important is because they provide a space that people actually feel um, are going to be safer for them to participate in. So thinking about, again, language, change rooms, you know, all of those things are kind of fundamental um, to being able to, you know, be a, be a part, be, you know, be a social citizen, so to speak, right? Um, it's really difficult to participate in any kind of, you know, social uh, event or a- activity if you, you know, can't have a space to change or feel comfortable in terms of how you're being recognized or addressed. So those are huge things. So I think having athletes at the elite level, uh, you know, who are very outspoken about being trans or queer, you know, the hope is that that, that will also um, foster, you know, more inclusivity and accessibility within sports. And I've seen over the, which has been really exciting, over the course of this project, you know, I did some research in Vancouver and, you know, I'm a graduate of UBC, so I used to love going to their pool, you know, and now going to their swimming pool, they have all gender washrooms. And we're seeing the growth of that across the city, you know, and across the country, I should say. And, you know, even, um, you know, going here and signing my kids up for swimming lessons, you know, now when I uh, kind of click on the, the gender drop down, there's a whole list of things. So it's not, you know, what I think we were even excited to see, which was, you know, female, male, 
other, which is really problematic for lots of reasons. But now there's actually a range of options that people can, you know, uh, identify by and the option to write in how you personally identify if it's not there. So we're seeing this huge shift. Um, and I think that there's a connection absolutely between, you know, more representation um, in conversation at, a, at an elite level. But also, I think this this grassroots um, activism has kind of pushed back uh, and got people to think about it differently. Like when people who work for the city are seeing applications for leagues uh, and, you know, are having conversations with city representatives, like referees and things about language and about making spaces more accessible, you know, having it happening at both levels is, is going to help. But but I really do feel that, you know, the community leagues have, have pushed for this and enabled that kind of um, supportive environment. Which is great to, to hear, and you see it a little bit. I mean, I've played in the Ottawa Rainbow League, the curling league here uh, that I, I've just spared a few times. And, and it does feel different in the building when that league is there. It, the Gay Nationals were here in 2019, and uh, I, I covered it for with the, the Game of Stones. And my brother and I were in there, and it just it felt different than a normal night yeah. it's same building same sheet of ice same rocks yeah. but it had a very different feel to it yeah well so, and this is something that you know you can't quite put your finger on but yes that there right. is um yeah and i think it's you know it's it's all part of it that there's that different kind of focus and uh, intent to bringing people together and then that what that makes possible and opens up as well yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and of course we hope too that the past almost two years now hasn't been too damaging to these leagues. Uh, you know, hopefully the, 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 the leagues can survive, uh, continue to go. Uh, certainly we've seen curling clubs across the country close. We've, we've seen contraction across sports while at the same time though, it has provided an opportunity both for the discussion around this to increase, but also maybe a, a, an adjustment of space. You talked about a gender neutral washrooms and change rooms. This could yes. present potentially an opportunity to uh, change those spaces when nobody is, is in there. You have an opportunity now if you need to do some sort of renovation uh, to do that. So it's, it's you know, there, there's a nervousness, I think, uh, about not being able to play, things being closed, but Absolutely. at the same time, does that create the opportunity? And I don't know, have, have you, been following that obviously the book is is out and so sometimes when book projects are finished people are just like well that's this i'm done with that but i, I don't know like has that been part of your thinking and and have you kept in touch with these folks to get a sense of how things have been going during covid well a little bit i mean i know you know some of the people that play on the leagues and uh you know personally and so i've been in touch with them and of course you know they just haven't been able to meet in the same ways and um the hope for the book was actually to kind of have a community event in both cities to kind of, again, you know, recognize how great, you know, both what I think um, is incredible about, you know, the community spaces that they, that they have, but also to kind of offer some gratitude for them, but that hasn't been possible, uh, unfortunately either. Um, so I know, I know that the, you know, people are still kind of, you know, connected, but, but not able to participate. And what I imagine is potentially also happening is, is, um, just as you kind of shared, I think for a lot of us during COVID, COVID, it's offered that kind of space of reflection. So I imagine there may be some people that are kind of sitting with things um, and thinking about, yeah, how might we do things slightly differently when we come back uh, or continue doing a lot of what we've already been doing. Um, and I can imagine it's being, you know, it's being quite a challenging time, particularly if it's kind of, you know, we can, we can maybe open up again. Oh no, we have to close back down again and, and trying to do the best to support community members. But um I can imagine it's been a huge loss um, for a lot of people that, uh, you know, that loss of connection and that loss of um, also opportunity to move our bodies. Right. Um, I think for a lot of us that that is really critical. So, yeah, I can imagine it's being, yeah, it's being felt in a lot of ways. Yeah. You can do video calls. You can do all that, but it's not, it's not the same as getting out and moving around and having, the face-to-face -face conversations. I mean, the first time I went and played, like I, I wasn't excited to curl last year. And then I went and I did it. And I, my body was like, oh, like this is what you're supposed to feel like. This is like, you're supposed yeah. to be around other human beings. You're supposed to move around a little bit. And yeah. even, even though going into it, I was like, this is probably isn't a good idea. I came out of that like feeling, I, fe I felt like I could lift a car the first night as I walked home, you know? So <laughs> you, you yeah. want, you want that for people and you want people to be yes. able to do that. And you know, as we come into the spring, 
in the summer, hopefully at least those outdoor softball, volleyball, soccer, those leagues hopefully can at least run and, and, and people can get back out and rebuild those relationships and get that yeah. physical activity back. And recognize, you know, how, yeah, you know, you just kind of share like how vital it is for all of us, right? We're, we're social beings, um, but also for a lot of people, you know, and I can include myself as a, you know, cis queer woman. I mean, I grew up, you know, being very physically active. And so being active was kind of core to my identity. And for a lot of people, it's also core to their gender identity, to their queer identities. Um, so it's a struggle to kind of have to reimagine that during, during COVID, um, you know, like I've been doing a lot of online exercise videos, which is very new for me, uh, but feel the sense of disidentification with what I sense are, you know, straight identifying, you know, cis women and, uh, and that, how that falls into a lot of, you know, pretty normative ideas about diet culture or, you know, feminine presentation. And so for a lot of people that just, you know, shuts down, um, you know, or, or puts up a barrier to engagement if you don't feel there are those spaces. I've heard of lots of um, other friends who found, you know, really awesome, <laughs> you know, queer, genderqueer um, people doing online exercise classes. So I think those those opportunities are there. You, you can search for them, but it's not the same as being able to go out to your kind of local community field or court and and play. Um, and, you know, I've, I've been part of a project here, the sort of the next kind of project I've been involved in, which is, you know, based on here on Treaty 4 territory in Regina, is uh, about queer movement, queer dance. And, you know, we offered three uh, workshops and just, you know, some of the feedback we got from people was, just being able to come into a space and have, you know, whether it's dance or whether it's other kinds of recreation and not have to worry about making someone else uncomfortable, not have to worry about um, people misgendering me, you know, just kind of knowing I can, I can be in this space and be as I am. And, you know, no matter how I'm presenting or how um, I'm dressed or how people are reading me and, uh, and really that recognition of the weight that a lot of people, um, you know, carry a lot as they move through society. Um, and so again, the, you know, the importance of those spaces. Yeah. And it's one of those things too, where if you're, if you don't carry that weight, you, you don't recognize or don't appreciate that other people are carrying that weight and therefore might not understand why these spaces are so important or why that type of representation is so important if you yourself have not experienced that. So uh, I, another reason why people should, uh, or I would encourage people to go check out the book. Again, it's who's coming out to play disruption and disorientation in queer community sports. Uh, so Claire, if people want the book or want more information about not only this project, but you mentioned the other uh, dance project, more information about what you're doing, where can they find it? And, and how would you uh, point them to get the book? Well, I mean, if they're interested in conversations, I love chatting with people about it. So I'm always open to people reaching out to me. Uh, you know, again, we're in COVID. So these opportunities to connect with people are so fantastic. Um, so people can definitely reach out to me. But the book is available through uh, McGill Queen's Press. Um, so it's available, I think, in like three different formats. So hopefully, you know, accessible, uh, um, more accessible than our kind of my my school options which was you know that heavy hard book thing but uh it's a you know it's a small book in lots of ways but but i hope uh, of interest to some people yeah it's been a great it's been a great project to work on to connect with people across the country yeah and uh, certainly cer certainly if you're in toronto vancouver check it out but uh, themes that are relevant uh, all across the country and internationally too like there's a, there's a lot of meat on this bone uh, if you will uh, so certainly encourage everybody to check it out. So Claire Carter, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.